Nice. Hey, Katie. Hi, Andrew. Does it look like I'm going somewhere? It does. Yeah, you look like you're dressed for something special. I am dressed. I am dressed to go to the High Sierra this summer. Perfect. Totally equipped. <laughs> so I thought we would start this stream um, by maybe make a few housekeeping announcements, and then I'll explain what's going on here. How does that sound? That sounds perfect. Okay. Let's dive into it. All right. So first, um, I see we've got a number of people already online with us. So thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate you taking the time out of your evening, and hopefully we can teach you a few things tonight. Um, we're going to go from 6 to 7 o'clock or until people stop asking questions. And um, uh, the goal tonight is to give you good information that will make your trips more fun, more practical, and maybe too, we're hoping to keep some people safer. Um, the conditions this summer and the high sea are going to be very real, very different than normal. So our job tonight is to help set your expectations and help you show up better prepared for your trip. Yep. Yep. So we've received um, at least 40 questions, probably a few more than that, um, through the email and the Reddit post and other places online. So we're going to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and then some of them Andrew is going to use as an opportunity to like do a little tutorial with. Um, if out of those questions that we received, if there were ones that were like easily found through a Google search or if it's like a, a hyper specific niche question, um, we may not answer them directly, but I combed through all of the questions. I pulled out all of the, the themes. And so that's how we're going to address them is through some broad themes and then maybe some specific trip examples. Um, if you were one of our guided trip uh, clients and you asked a question um, that was also super specific to your trip, we're probably just going to forward that to instructor so that you will hear back about that. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, and if your question didn't per pertain to like anything like um, early season conditions, we're probably going to table it for now. Um, and then generally I am going to, so we're going to go back and forth. I'll answer some from that we received via online and then um, questions that are coming into the chat. I will also be uh, pulling those out as well. And we'll kind of go back and forth like that. I'll try and chime in on some of the answers, but I'll probably just be keeping up with the chat and mostly Andrew's going to tackle this. So shall we dive in? I think we should. But okay. first, um, Katie, okay. uh, I had a pretty busy day printing out maps and, and rosters and putting together, like packing the van. Um, mm -hmm. But this weekend, I'm not going anywhere. Where are you going? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm going to be, be guiding in the sand dunes this weekend uh, while you're hanging out at home, hopefully getting some work done and enjoying time with Amanda and the cats. Um, so yeah, we have our we have two trips in the sand dunes this weekend, um, which are going to be phenomenal. Uh, and then yeah, 10 days after that, headed to Alaska and the Sierras shortly after that. So those trips start late July. We do still have um, a couple of spots, three, five, and seven day trips open. Um, we have some stuff shifting around with the rosters, but if anyone wants to jump into those. Um, and then Washington trips after that, definitely some spots on the 11 days uh, open, and then a few spots in West Virginia. So, yes. Overall, Again, folks, we're, we're very full, but we always usually get a few cancellations at this time of the year. So if you're interested in joining us on a trip, um, go ahead and apply. Okay, let's jump into this. You ready? Yes. Okay. okay. So a big question. Oh, do you? why don't you talk about what you're wearing? I think first? I'm just going to start with I mean, what I'm wearing. Yeah. I so talk about let, that. I, so um, let's actually start with this, this preface that there is a right way to backpack. And I know that's not a popular opinion, but here's why. The right way to backpack is by, is by carrying or by having the gear supplies and skills that are appropriate for your trip objectives and for the conditions that is the right way to backpack so i think it's it would be um uh, a good thing tonight to start just by talking about the likely conditions in the high sierra this summer and you know in a normal year this like these early season conditions which is almost like a blend of mountaineering and backpacking you would expect that certainly in may and then usually into June, and it depends a little bit on what the snowpack, like what the winter was like, but sometime in June, it transitions from early season to like summer conditions. And usually by July 1st, it feels like summer, the trails are melted out, except for the highest passes. Um, the bugs are gonna come out shortly after that. The water levels have come down. But this year we're expecting these early season conditions to persist through July and partway into August. And I think no one's really certain exactly how deep into August these conditions are going to go. So the what I want to show you is just some differences 
um, in what I'm going to carry or in what I'm going to wear versus maybe what I would normally do. So um, the conditions that I'm specifically expect are expecting, I'm expecting extensive lingering snowpack at elevations that I would normally wouldn't see it in June, in July and August. I'm expecting um, a lot of snow melt and that's going to lead to a lot of groundwater where just everything is just kind of wet and flooded and then also very high water crossings for any of the creeks. I'm also expecting a, um, a delayed and prolonged mosquito season. So it, normally they hatch in July, but if the ground is still so cold because of all the, the, the cold snow melt, um, they might not come out until like late July, even August. And then I would expect, give, just given how wet it is, that they're going to stick around until the first frost of the fall. And then the final conditions, this would be like condition number five, just expect like highly variable conditions. So every day you're dealing with changing um, snowpack, level, snowpack levels. So basically like every day you'll see it melt a little bit more. Every day there'll be a difference in the snow composition from morning to afternoon to night. Um, the bugs are going to change based on elevation, slope aspect, proximity to water. Um, and uh, the water levels will also change dramatically from from morning to night. So just to be expecting, it's sort of like it's a uh, it's chess versus checkers if you want to think about it that way. You just kind of need to be always thinking about um, what the likely conditions are going to be tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow tomorrow evening, and like and planning your like, trip around that. So let's let's look at what I what I have first. I have my head net, and the head net is it's a vital piece of equipment. I'm going to take it off for a minute. So the headnet's a vital piece of equipment. It will just keep your sanity. And this is made out of mosquito netting, not noceum netting. So um, they're very easy to breathe through. You can actually, like, the wind will blow through these. Um, uh, you will start, when if you wear these often enough, you'll wear them so much that they just become part of you and you will start to like drink through them. You'll try to eat through them. I have definitely like hucked loogies into mine before not realizing that I was still wearing it. So that's my head nut. I'm going to be wearing a dark pair of sunglasses. These aren't your normal like summertime sunglasses. They don't transition. They're just like very dark. So like glacier goggles, like five, six percent visual light transmission. And as Katie was just saying, so you notice there's like no gapage on the side of my face. Because um, a normal pair of glasses would, would have some, and just that little bit of light getting in would make a big difference. You might now see around my face, I have I have um, Dermatone, Dermatone sunscreen, and you just lather this all over your nose and all over your lips. Those parts of your face just get destroyed by the sun um, with, and all that reflectivity. I have on a, this is a hoodie. This is like an L.L. Bean permethrin treated hoodie. It's great for some protection because this is the only part of my body that is um, that is protected or that is open. And then it's permethrin treated, so the, the mosquitoes like remarkably will not bite me through the shirt. Um, you'll also you can't see it, but if I stand up, you see I have pants on. Um, I'm not going to bother going with shorts this summer, whereas normally I would in July and August. I would probably try to wear shorts um, in at least in the woods. But given the bugs and given the sun exposure, you might as well just wear pants the whole time. I have sun gloves. Um, on for shoes, I have um, on this shoe. I have this. These are the Cotula crampons. On this shoe, I have, these are the Cotula micro spikes. And I would say one or the other. We'll get into that that detail shortly. For um, nighttime, you'll notice that on this leg, I have a bread bag. Katie, you want to explain to everyone how we use the bread bags? Yes, we use the bread bags. Uh, when you get to camp, your feet will be soaking wet. So you take your wet shoes and socks off. You let your feet dry out for a little bit. You put your dry socks on, your sacred dry camp socks that are never worn to hike in. And then you put the bread bags over the dry socks and you put your feet back into your wet shoes and you are happy. It works really well, lighter weight than camp shoes um, and uh, probably warmer too. So. Yeah. A um, couple of other things I'm going to bring with me. I'm going to bring with me a ground sheet that is like going to add some waterproofness to my tent. This allows me to sleep on soggy ground, which might be inevitable, um, or even having to sleep on snow. I'm also going to bring me with me a warmer sleeping pad. So I would say like at a minimum, uh, an X light, new, like newer X light, which is R value of like 3.7, and uh, this is the X term, which is R value of five. And again. The, the idea with a warmer sleeping pad, it's just going to buy us the opportunity to sleep on snow if we have to. 
Um, sleeping in snow is not that great. It's kind of cold. Um, but if you've got a good pad, it's not the end of the world. Okay, for equipment, I have with me an ice axe. This is the Black Diamond Raven Pro. Um, I think this is a great ice axe if you're going to be using it regularly. It's got good heft. Um, it's, it's a good balance of weight and performance. If you think you might need an ice axe just in case, there are, there are ultralight models. But I will tell you that um, if you just want to buy one ice axe that you're going to use every, you know, every couple of years and um, just buy something like this, I think it's um, the, 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 um, the extra heft that this has makes it perform a lot better when you actually need it. I think the other ice axe is more like a just in case type of ice axe. And of course, um, another item I have with me, I definitely are going to be carrying trekking poles. Trekking poles um, are great for, um, for traveling on snow for crossing rivers, for probing um, ice bridges, and then the natural things or the standard things like setting up your shelter and helping to um, uh, offload some of the weight when you're hiking uphill and downhill. I think that's kind of the list. I think that's it. Did okay. you mention bug netting in your shelter? Oh, I didn't mention that. Thank you. It's sitting down over here. So this is a little, this show and this does not show and tell quite as well, but I'm definitely going to bring with me the inner for my shelter. So this is the, the internet for my solo, uh, my, my mountain model design solo mid, um, it, you know, it adds 10 ounces maybe, but man, anyone who's ever been kept up by a single mosquito, you know how annoying that is. So 10 ounces, I think is a good investment of weight. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let me address two quick questions that were in the chat before we jump into some of the email questions. Um, someone said, are there permethrin treated pants? Um, not, no, I doubt that Andrews are. And I would say those are not totally, those, those aren't really necessary um, because they're a little looser on the skin and they tend to be a little bit thicker of a weave. So we don't tend to recommend those. Uh, okay. And then will there be notes? Um, no, but you could take notes. And also a lot of this information is in the um, blog post that Andrew recently posted. Um, yes. Okay. So let's I love that someone is asking if we're taking notes. I know. Like, <laughs> I'm not, so flattering. Someone else could. Flattering. <laughs> um, so I want to start broad. So there were a lot of questions around like how to assess condition. So what online resources are best for assessing uh, snow and stream conditions in the high Sierra? So okay. why don't we start there and then we can go narrow into uh, like addressing what some of those conditions, um, the implications of those. Okay. I think we can do that. Okay. So I am going to share my screen. Okay, so let's start with let's start with snow. And okay, um, when I'm when I'm sort of hanging out at home in the winter. To look at snowpack, I like the um, California Interactive Snow Plots. I think this gives that's nah, going to bring me a dead page. Oh, the Night of Nights. That's so. That's <laughs> okay. It looks like this. We'll just go back to this. Um, so it's called Interactive Snow Plots, and this is a great way of just figuring out kind of where the snowpack is relative to um, relative to past years. So right now, the line we're at is, are we at blue? Oh, there's been a lot of melt. OK, so this is the dark blue line. So you can see that this winter, at least in the north and in the central part of California, um, it was kind of on par with the 82, 83 winter, um, and the, but the spring melt has happened a little bit more quickly. And then you see here that the melt is happening. You know, it actually like was for quite a bit of the winter greater than the 82, 83 winter, and now it's dropping off of a cliff. So it's like very, very, very rapid melt. And you'll notice for anyone who's out there into the 2018, 19 winter, which is another big one, you'll notice like how much more snow there was. Um, this past winter than there was that year, which was regarded as a really heavy winter. So, okay, so this is where I go to to look for um, to look for like the snowpack over the course of the winter. When I am ready to figure out where there's snow now, I'm going to use um, a site like Caltopo. Um, you could also use. Uh, I'll grab you the link. 
but Caltop was kind of my preferred. So this is the Tuolumne Meadows. And if you go down here, if you have a pro subscription to Caltopo, you can access the Sentinel Weekly uh, imagery. And so this is um, satellite imagery taken every week. And um, the neat thing is that it has an archive. So like you can see that this was taken on, this is taken on the 26th of May. And you can see that the snow is like slowly moving up. Uh, this is going to be, that's going to be the Tuolumne River into, into Tuolumne Meadows. And then Yosemite Valley is is down here. So you can see the snow line is gently creeping up. And if you're sort of curious about what it might be like in July, the best thing to do is use the archives. So like the last the last big, big winter, one of them was 2009, one of them was the 1819 winter. So you could look through the archives there and you might be like, hey, my trip is my trip is the middle of my trip this year in July or is in late July 2023 that 1819 winter was not quite as heavy so what were the conditions like on July 9th and this will give you an idea so this imagery here was taken on the 6th of July and it gives you an idea about where there where the snow is and I actually I was there at this time of the year in 2019 I remember like there was snow on the north side of uh, this ridge here over by Young Lakes but you'll see that it rapidly like it it disappears quickly. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to upload. So that's the best way to, to do snow over the course of the winter. And then as you're approaching your trip to see exactly where it's still hanging out. And again, you can use the historical data to sort of extrapolate. And then as far as the stream levels go, what, you're, um, what you'll want to use, I'm really, this is, struggling tonight. As that loads, I'm going to mention a couple of things. Yep. Um, so um, kind of uh, adding on to what Andrew was just saying, we received a lot of questions uh, along the lines of, I have a permit for July uh, 23rd on the JMT. What are the conditions like on Kearsarge Pass or Bishop Pass similarly? Or like I'm so bowing the JMT starting in August. Uh, what do you think the north side of the passes are going to look like um, or one that just showed up in the chat um, conditions on the JMT in early September. So you can just um, go to that Sentinel weekly layer that Andrew was just showing us on Caltopo um, and look at the historical dates like he was doing and just go to every part of your route and follow it along and then extrapolate from there. Like there's we can't know. We don't have the crystal ball to show us exactly what it's going to look like in July or August or September. But knowing that those will probably be a little bit behind in melt um, on those bigger years in the past, you can go through your whole route and look at those places that you're having questions about. So I just wanted to point that out because we had a lot of questions like that. Like what will the conditions be like on X spot in the Sierras at like X date this summer? So the CDEC website is down, but I um, the USGS website's live. So we're gonna go ahead and jump over there. So as far as monitoring uh, water levels, you can use there are there are gauges um, in several important spots in the High Sierra. Um, I can go ahead and um, this section. This is a blog post on my website. This is the hazardous High Sierra creeks, the list maps and alternates. And right in here, there are links to all of the gate the relevant gauges. And I don't think it's important to know you're like, oh, I'm going to cross Woods Creek. How big is Woods Creek? Woods Creek, like knowing exactly how big Woods Creek is, it's be helpful, but you can drive a lot of meaning from the gauge that's at the South Fork of the Kings River right at right at Cedar Grove. So and there and there is a there is a gauge there. So here's a good here's a good um, anyone who's in Yosemite you can get a sense or anyone who's planning a trip in Yosemite you can get a sense for the the snow melt patterns. Um, there's a gauge at the Merced River at the Happy Isles Bridge which is right at the it's at the eastern edge of Yosemite Valley. It's right where the John Muir Trail starts. And there are a couple of things I want to point out here. One is notice the diurnal cycles of the of the melt. So every so basically, like it's highest in the um, it's going to be highest in the. Interestingly, here it's actually highest in the middle of the night, um, because it's further downstream from where the melt is actually happening. Like where we tend to backpack, the melt is actually highest or usually like late afternoon or early evening like around dinner so it seems to be topping out in the middle of the night you can see like three this is 3 30 a.m and then it goes down um 
because it's not kept because there isn't as much snow melting um, in the cooler parts of the day. And then it goes back up and then it goes back down. And these are big differences. So like this is, um, you know, every day you're looking at, so like if you were to have crossed the Merced River, you're looking at a height of like 6.7 feet. And then here at 7.4, so that's like 15, 20% difference, maybe 15% difference. And like that is an amount that if you're like playing the margins, that could be enough for whether something is a safe crossing versus whether something is really hazardous. So with these gauges, you can put, you can look at old data. Um, i trying to remember how to do this here. Here we go. So I can look at, um, let me try, if, I'm going to try, um, I think it wants a very specific, like, you know, 6 a.m. value or something. I don't know if I have time. Katie, you want to, while I'm messing around with this, do you want to grab a question? Yes. Um, well, where I was going to go with this, since you were talking about, um, yeah. like, the, the water levels right now, there are several questions about stream crossings. And I think this is where you're going in a minute, is, is how long into the season do you anticipate high water levels yeah. to exist? Um, but we can um, come back to that. Another stream. Process. I think that's actually it. Let's let's jump into that. And I really wish that the CD sub website was live. Oh, here it goes. Okay. I was having I was looking at this earlier, and it was having some connectivity issues. So I'm going to use the here's Yosemite. I'm the the one I look at a lot is because we run trips there. It's the the one right at um, it's KR. It's the it's the South Fork of the Kings. And if you dig into this, you look at the um, you look at the flow. Oh, bummer. Okay, this is not gonna this is not gonna cooperate with us tonight. But so I was looking at it, and the what the one thing that one thing that I saw was that um, the one thing that I saw was that the the flow levels this year already are bigger than they were in two thousand and nineteen and two thousand and and two thousand and seventeen. It's so like by a significant amount. So like the current river was flowing at like 8,500 cubic feet per second the other day. And I don't think it ever got to those levels in 2019 or 2000, 2017. So I'm expecting, the, the one thing, I th maybe like a hydrologist, hydrologist could, could answer this really well, but the one thing that we haven't seen is like, what happens when you combine extensive snow coverage with like a lot of snow depth at high elevations and then in like the the like the most brutal part of the summer so like when fresno is 105 110 degrees what does that translate to what is like the maximum potential melt in a day if you have all if you have all that snow up there it actually kind of reminds me a little bit of like hot summer days in alaska where um, the glaciers start to melt and those are actually those are in alaska you get the highest flows in the summertime um, because there's basically an infinite amount of water that could melt from those glaciers. And you almost have a similar thing that could happen this summer where you might have just still extensive snow coverage, like full snow coverage on July 1st in, in parts of the high Sierra. And then you combine that with like 80 degree temperatures. Like, what is that going to look like? It could be really something. I would expect to answer the question. I would expect high water um, into August with variation depending on watershed size slope aspects like whether it's a north safe north facing or south facing slope and then and then um like just part of the time of the day yeah i don't i don't think anything's going to feel safe until like the end of august do you want to speak to um the safest and most effective ways to cross like high high water and also similarly yeah. someone asked um how can we tell what is safe to attempt and what is not safe to attempt <laughs> Well, let's let's answer that first one or the second one first. So, like, what's safe versus unsafe? Like, I, I think it's like a gut feel, isn't it? I think it depends on the person. I think it depends yeah. on your experience. Are you alone or with you? Are you with a group? <clears throat> um, but yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it depends on the person. Yeah. How about talking about like what you might do when you get to a, a high water crossing? Yeah. So I never. I always want to be. Um, 100% certain that I'm going to get across. And um, if I'm leading a group, I also want to be 100% certain that 
every person in my group is going to be able to get across. So I have, there have been a couple of occasions where I've, where I have, where I've been a step or two away from the other shore and didn't like it enough. I felt like, you know, someone's going to mess up here and I've turned back. And I think, um, so you just have to feel that way. And because, you know, you don't have to cross there. Like, you know, if you plan your route properly and if you built in some cushion, you can go find other places. And I think maybe that's a good segue into the, you know, how do you, how do you cross safely part, right? So mm -hmm. I'll, let me share my screen um, and let me talk about a few. I think that speaks also to like um, uh, the mi a mindset more broadly mm -hmm. when approaching conditions like this. It's not just about like crossing high water. If you get to a slope that seems like it's too steep um, for the for the gear that you have with you, um, always having like those those detours planned out ahead of time and not feeling like you're forced into a decision that's not a safe decision. So I'm going to I'm I'm zooming in right now on Rush Creek. So Rush Creek is it's in like northern Inyo National Forest. This is the boundary with Yosemite. Anyone who's on the John Muir Trail um, and, or the Pacific Crest Trail, you're going to cross into the park at Donahue Pass. So this is like a this is a it's funny. This crossing doesn't seem like it's that big, but I remember um, I, in fact, I posted a photo of it earlier today on, on social media of like the, it's a double log bridge and the whole like far side of the logs are submerged in like six inches of water. And, um, so one way to, one way to safely cross Creek. So here's the, here's the official crossing of, um, or the trail crossing of Rush Creek. But if you were just to walk, how far is that? If you were to walk. 2,100 feet, so that's 700 yards uphill on the trail. You can cross where these, um, what are these? The Potnaster, is that the right word? The Potnaster Lakes. And this this is all flat in here. This is basically going to be a big, marshy, flooded area. And there's going to be like high, it might be deep, um, but it would be slow moving and it would feel very safe compared to the actual trail crossing. So that's one way to do it. Basically, you look for a place you you go um, upstream or downstream to a place where there's less gradient. And in here, you can see there's like, there's no contour line in this entire area. So this whole area would be much safer than the trail crossing where the creek starts to drop rapidly through, through contour lines. So that's one thing you can do. Um, so go find something flatter. Another thing you can do is you don't, sometimes you don't have to cross. So let me, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm moving down into Sequoia Kings. And I'm going to the South Fork. Oh, I think I'm even a little lost here. OK, there's Muir Pass. So I need to go further south than this. OK, here's Woods. Here we go. OK, so here's another example. So this is um, in Kings Canyon National Park. And this is the John Muir Trail, and it cro this is the South Fork of the Kings River. And you'll notice that the John Muir Trail crosses the South Fork right here. And then it just um, it goes upstream parallel to it until it crosses again, uh, basically like up in, up in here. It gets up into the headwaters. So if you were on the John Muir Trail, the much safer thing to do is to not cross the South Fork. It's that you would actually just from here you would walk along this side of the, of the creek and you just stay on this right side. And these are going to be relatively small feeder streams until you get up into the headwaters and then you can rejoin, rejoin the main trail. So you can basically just avoid the trail entirely. So that's a good, another good option, just um, you know, minimizing your crossings if possible. And then here's a third example. So I'm going to go to Selden Pass. OK, so here's Selden Pass. And the challenge here is you have to cross. This is a famous crossing of Bear Creek. So the, the crossing is right, right here. And the, the challenge is that you have three forks. You have the West Fork. You've got like a Middle Fork. They call that the South Fork. And then you have an East Fork. So there are three forks of Bear Creek that come in. And the trail, again, you can see the black line, and it crosses all three forks after they've combined, and it crosses it right here. And this is a difficult crossing. The better thing to do if you were, if, like, if you were concerned about water is you would leave the trail right here. You've already crossed, at this point, the West Fork. 
and you work your way across this bench and you would cross this little outflow and you could drop down and you could cross the east fork right here and you could join up with this trail right here and then stay on the right side of the trail and and your money so you basically have just uh, i think the right term is like divide and conquer is the right approach or the, the way to kind of think about that so there are three um three ways that you can cross trails safely or tr cross streams safely um flatter or less velocity places where they're flatter um uh, just avoid crosses crossings entirely if they're unnecessary and then take them on where they're smaller so they're at their tributaries mm -hmm. katie do we want to talk to about like specific crossing techniques for you know i was just gonna bring that up i think with it um we should point people to the blog post for that um because there are a lot of other questions in here that uh i think would be great to speak to okay okay so because we go through those in the blog post quite in detail so um yeah tips for like when you do decide that it's safe to cross some tips on how to do so safely so check yep. out the, the blog post i just went out about that um i think it'd be great to dive into there's a lot of questions around um gear specifically like ice axes crampons and micro spikes so um let's start with well okay so around what month would we expect not to have to bring an ice axe as well well, I think I think whether you have to bring an ice axe, I don't think like I don't think bringing an ice axe is necessarily a guarantee. I don't think that's like you have to bring an ice axe. I think you look at your route and you fit your route um, based on the topography and based on the contour lines whether an ice axe is going to be warranted or not. So, um, if you're planning on a going over a pass like King Call or some off, so like Snow Tongue Pass or um, Matterhorn or something that's you know, like class two plus class three then sure i think you should probably have an ice axe but you know if you're if you're just going over your pass or um or kearsarge or some of these other like broader flatter passes an ice axe is not a necessary piece of equipment mm -hmm. and i would and katie i'd like you to chime in here but i think given the amount of snow i would exp i would say that probably for anyone who's planning an aggressive itinerary you're probably looking at an ice axe all summer and there are going to be passes that that do not many passes that do not melt out this year and mm -hmm. in august like the snow might be soft um but it's still going to be like a pretty serious fall potential and then by the time you start looking at like the end of august beginning of september you could be looking at freezing nights mm -hmm. so you might be looking at some firm snow in the morning yeah and it just opens up more options so you don't have to wait until the snow softens up to feel safe going up something steep or um, you know, it doesn't take that much terrain of like ha where it's necessary that like you're really glad that you have it on you. Um, so, yeah. Um, someone said and on this topic, someone said, I have an entry date of August 2nd. What do you think about carrying a whippet pole instead of an axe? I haven't used a whippet much. Uh, actually, never. Um, I know Hunter Hall, one of our guys, ad adores his. Um, I think it I've always felt like it locked me into a pair of trekking poles that I didn't actually want to be carrying. So I would prefer just a dedicated ice axe, dedicated, um, dedicated trekking pole. Um, I understand the appeal of kind of the multi-purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple. I think what's to say there, like if if I want an ice axe, I want an ice axe. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, I think it's a I think it's a very different tool than like a blade attached a, that's attached to my trekking pole. I feel that way too. If carrying crampons and an ice axe for a mid-July trip, should I consider carrying snowshoes also so I can hike in the afternoons without post holing? This person is doing a blended JMT uh, Sierra high route trip. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this like snowpack, like snow composition yeah. issue. Um, so Katie, how many miles do you think you've post holed in your life? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to think about that number. Are you are you at least in triple digits? I don't know if I'm well, probably around triple digits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So when when are you most likely to post hole? Uh, in the afternoon when it's soft. Yeah, when the snow softens, right? And and even um, where else are you gonna maybe post hole? Mm -hmm. like south facing slopes or the edge of snow fields there you go that's a good one the edge of snow fields because what's happening is that the snow is snow. it's melting from the bottom and from the top and it's just melted all the way through it's just just like slush the whole way through mm -hmm. yeah and then the other place where you'll uh, post hole are around uh, the rock moats 
-hmm. you get close to a boulder and the boulder is heating up the snow around it um, mm -hmm. so those are your like your three most likely scenarios so edges edges of snow fields rock moats and then in the afternoon but when does um like if you're uh, if you find snow in july or august are you thinking that you might post hole in it no it's usually well in july and august yeah in july and august sure it could be in the afternoon i mean it's often pretty consolidated but yeah, it's usually it depends where you are. It depends where you are. So like Colorado has Colorado has kind of rot more rotten snowpack. Mm -hmm. um, so post holing in July or August is probably not out of the question in Colorado. But in California, usually if you find snow in July or August, it's pretty well consolidated, and um, uh, it, it's um, it will support a lot of weight. It will be slushy and punchy up on the surface, but you're not going to post hole through it. So back to this question of snowshoes, Katie, if you're have you recruited snowshoes in early season conditions? Early, early, early season? Well, no, like, Loose, May, but like May, June. Like yeah. So they're heavy. Um, they're awkward. And I actually don't think that they're going to save you from post holing. Like if the snow is rotten, it just it doesn't support any weight at all. So snowshoes really aren't going to help. Um, I think that they, they could might maybe buy you a few extra hours, but um, the alternative, the better alternative, in my mind, is just to wake up early and get a lot of miles done before this before the snow warms up. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a lot of people asked about? Um, yeah. I mean, essentially, the question was: I'm doing like GMT Sierra High Route. How do I decide between micro spikes or crampons? At snowshoes was were mentioned yeah. as well, but I think we just covered that. Um, right. And then also the the ice axe versus whip it, which I think. Okay. So, yeah. So let's let's let me um let me break this down. So I've got I have both of these with me. So for a lot of folks, the micro spikes are going to be um, or something similar. So these are the Catula micro spikes. These are going to be okay. They're three eighths inch uh, cleats, and they'll get you extra purchase on softer snow, um, especially like they do best on firmer snow. So if it's even like like icy and glazy, that's kind of the, the best use for them. Um, the, the micro spikes struggle if the snow is really soft. They just, that the 3 8 inch cleats just don't have that much bite. Um, so your next step up is to go with something like a, like a, this is a, the Cthulhu crampon. This is actually the original Cthulhu crampon. And these are like, these look like maybe 5 8 inch, maybe, maybe, I don't, I doubt they're 3 quarter inch. Maybe they were a 3 quarter inch at one point. These have a lot more bite, but they're, um, they're heavier. They're more awkward to put on and take off, um, and they don't feel like they don't feel as natural when you're when you're hiking with them. So I think it's a simple trade-off option. It's that if you're doing something aggressive, you should probably have um, a proportionally aggressive um, crampon style, um, like something crampon-ish. And then if you are sticking to easy trails that aren't real steep and that probably are going to be pretty well packed out, you can go with something like the micro spikes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think um, sort of to, to like something that has come up a lot is like, if you're expecting like extensive travel, like if you're traveling a long way and you're going off trail, um, adjusting your gear accordingly, like just planning for um, like to, to have the crampons instead of the micro spikes or possibly to carry the ax because those north facing slopes might not melt at all out at all. Um, so thinking about it that way, the longer you're going to be out there and the less well-traveled your route, um, you may want to be carrying some of these things that you might not on a, a more well-traveled or uh, route or something that doesn't have as steep of um, slopes that you have to go up. Uh, let's jump to, actually for, on gear for a second, uh, more um, given the, I just think this is a good one to speak to, given the snow, wet conditions, what footwear do you recommend both for hiking and camp shoes? So camp shoes, we talked about where your bread bags. But yep. for hiking, let's talk about like the features of what shoe you might be looking for. Yeah. So this is my favorite. This is the La Sportiva Bushido. And this actually this works great. This works great as an early season condition shoe for a couple of reasons. First is that it's a pretty aggressive, like not super aggressive, but pretty aggressive outsole, like with decent size um, lugs. So and they've got good sharp edges on them, which makes a big difference too. They're not like rounded edges on the lugs. The other thing I like about the Sportiva is that it's pretty stiff underfoot, and this allows me to kick steps, and it also allows me to hold my edges if I'm like hiking, like side hilling up something steep. It takes a lot pressure, a lot of the pressure off of my feet, as opposed to wearing a 
um, something say like the you know like the alt the uh, ultra lone peak is would be like the classic where it's like it's kind of a wet noodle underfoot so it's diff they're difficult they don't do great in kicking steps and they don't do great in holding edges just because they're very soft in the midsole the um, bushido also has a very durable outsole and probably what I'll, what I'll do before this year's trips is I'll um, the blowout point that I usually see with the bushido is like right in here on the on the toe box so I'll probably beef this up with some aqua seal just to give me some extra abrasion resistance in this area and maybe even to um, put some aqua seal on all of the exposed lacing. The ice, the snow and the ice can be really abrasive and really sharp. Um, so it will it will destroy shoes much more quickly than, than just normal conditions. Um, these shoes are breathable. Um, so when my feet get wet, which is absolutely inevitable, um, those shoes are gonna drain more quickly than waterproof shoes. And um, maybe if there's some extended period of of dry trail, they might dry out completely. They might dry out overnight, but I'm not planning on at any point in my trip to have dry shoes or dry socks. I think it usually it's going to be some variation of damp. I think like um, early season conditions are very are like right on par with like Alaska, like throughout the summer. And in Alaska, it's like your feet get wet and stay wet. And the best solution is just to have a pair of dedicated sleeping socks and bread bags for when you pull into camp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's do one more gear question before moving up to camping on snow. Um, so uh, someone said, uh, would you recommend permethrin treated shirt and a head net? Yes, we do. And how does um, the DIY, DIY permethrin treatment compare to like insect shield or other treatments? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Katie's seen this firsthand too. So we, we run a lot of trips um, in buggy conditions. Like I've seen some horrific bugs in, in California, but also in Alaska too. And the, the factory treated permethrin garments work way better than the do it yourself treatments. It's like, it's night and day. And like the do it yourself, like it is partially effective, but when you see it compared to um, a factory treated garment, it's, it's clear like w w which one is better. So um, if you, um, if you, you can find permethrin treated shirts like this one I bought from L.L. Bean earlier this season. It was like 80 bucks. And it's like exactly what I would wear a hoodie to the Sierra anyway because of the sun exposure. So it's great to have the permethrin built right into it. Um, if, uh, if you have a shirt that you love or pants that you love or socks that you love, you can actually send everything to Insect Shield and they'll treat it for you. And I think um, you can do it per garment. I think it's something like 10 bucks per garment. Or you can get a bag. And the bag will have like, uh, I think it has like 15 space for like 15 to 20 items and you ship it to them. And I think it's 120 bucks for them to do that. So permethrin is, it's awesome stuff. I, it's game changing for hiking in buggy conditions. Yep, agreed. All right, let's talk about camping on snow. So um, special considerations for site selection um, that would be different this year versus like a snow free year. And then similarly, uh, someone had said, how do you manage if sites available are only saturated ground and rotten snow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, you know, probably like, you know, very likely, right? So, um, you know, the ideal thing is that you, like, if you, as soon as you get on site, you should be looking around and starting to observe. If you're like, where's the snow at what elevation at what slope aspects um, where am i likely to find dry ground <clears throat> and then you could just maybe try to plan your itinerary around that so if you're noticing that you're seeing like um, plenty of snow free ground below 9,000 feet on southerly on south on south facing aspects then just figure out how to get down to 9,000 feet in a south, south facing aspect to finish the day um, and just, you know, you might have to be a little bit flexible to make that happen. Um, if you do have to camp on snow, um, I think, Katie, I'd be curious, like, if you had your choice, if you're like, well, I can camp on snow or I can camp in, like, a soggy dirt. I think I'd camp on snow. I think I would camp on snow, yeah. too. Yeah. Because yeah. the snow, you can you can contour it to, like, mm -hmm. your exact body position. Um, and if your sleeping pad is warm enough, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not an issue. But, like, yeah, camping in, like, mud, yeah, that's what the Appalachian Trail is for. <laughs> okay um anything else you want to talk about with camping on snow i think yeah i think something to kind of like highlight um broadly is just there's a lot of thought that goes into what your day looks like as far as like when you're going to be hitting 
like when when you want to be hitting places where where the snow is going to be like like if you're going to walk on flat areas you want to hit it early in the morning or when the snow is still frozen but if you have a steep slope to go up and you don't have the proper equipment you may not want to hit it at that time and like thinking ahead where am i going to end up tonight and what does that set me up for the following day so i think there's just like a lot of thinking ahead um, where am I going to camp tonight? And can I, can that be in like a lower area or a South facing aspect? Yeah. Um, and what's the bigger river, what's the biggest river crossing of the day? And when do I, when do I really want to cross it? Yeah. You know, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe you park yourself on the near side of a, of a big river crossing and with the, with the plan of crossing it in the morning when it's lowest. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's a great point that Katie just made everyone. Like you have to be planning your days in consideration of all of these factors. Um, real quickly from the chat, um, someone speaking about um, treated clothing, what do you recommend getting treated? Um, for sh I would say for sure your shirt. Um, uh, socks, I think, are nice to get treated because, like, the mosquitoes love the ankles. Yeah, um, they love the ankles. They love nasty okay. shoes, like <laughs> nasty shoes. They'll just, like, land on your shoes. And you're like, dude, like, I don't even like my shoes being, you know, four feet away from my nose. So, yeah, socks are nice. And I think we're in agreement. We don't bother with pants because they're just the fabric is kind of thick for a mosquito. The mosquitoes tend to tend to bite tend to struggle to bite through it anyway. And then the fabric is kind of loosely draping over you, so it's not like a shirt where like you know, like the fabric is right in contact with my skin. They'll get you like right where you can't reach. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's, let's speak of mosquitoes. Uh, thoughts on when the insect pressure will be worse this year? So I think mosquitoes are probably already coming out at some elevations. Um, the high country is still under snow, so there are no mosquitoes up high. Like, <laughs> and I would, I, can I think that the mosquitoes, I mean, they might not come out until the end of July, just because the ground, the groundwater has to get to a certain temperature before they'll hatch. So if the groundwater is constantly being replenished by cold snow melt, then it's going to stay too cold. So I would say like maybe end of July, middle of July, end of July, for like heavy mosquito pressure up high. And then um, um, they're gonna be worse. They're gonna be the worst around water, which is gonna be kind of everywhere. And um, in the evening, they tend to go away at night because it gets too cold. And they tend not to be around much in the morning because it's still too cold. They tend not to be around too much during the day because it's windy. They prefer the woods over the open. But if I could say, um, if you're going up there, I'm going to say middle of July through the middle of September this year, you should just expect bugs and maybe quite a few of them. So plan accordingly with permethrin, with, with, um, with, a, with, a, with a shelter that has a bug net and the rest. Um, Katie, I think we have a visitor. Oh, boy. <laughs> He wants me to come watch TV with him. Yeah. We're at Andrew's here because adventures. We never hesitate to stop a meeting for potential <laughs> cat sightings. <laughs> yeah, okay. you, don't have, you don't have kids. I know. Uh, let's talk about avalanche awareness. A few questions about that um, that came up. Um, some typical. Well, first, I, if you want to speak broadly to like, is this a, a concern of yours? And then, what are some typical indications or warning signs that the snow um, essentially might be unstable? So I would be curious to hear from someone who really understands avalanches really well. That's not really my specialty, but it's not the risk that keeps me up at night. So like when I think about leading um, trips in the, like the end of July and beginning of August this year, that the biggest concerns I have are water crossings. That's number one and snow travel would be number two. Um, the bugs are just gonna be an annoyance, but something that can be totally managed. I don't think that much about the avalanches. Um, I think if you're, um, but this is such a weird, like a, such a record winner. So there could be something freaky. Um, I would watch out for, if, you, if you're seeing signs of, of recent slides, that's where you would probably go like, hey, what's up with that? And then mm -hmm. um, I think that wet slides tend to be like 15 to 25 degrees on slope angle. Um, probably what it, in the Sierra, probably it would be on some sort of very clean bed surface, like a big granite slab. Um, and the, the um, 
the prerequisite usually for a wet slide, you're going to see a lot of pinwheeling. So literally like the snow will, you'll get little balls of snow that will come off and they'll, they will become bigger and bigger. And they become like this big pinwheel by the time they get down to the bottom. So if you're seeing a lot of that, mm -hmm. um, maybe um, sort of just tuck that one away and say, hey, that's weird. Like we, we need to be paying attention to this. And right. uh, um, the other consideration too is that if something's going to slide, usually it's going to be when the sun is just beating on it in the afternoon. Yeah, like rapid warming. Um, I think some other things to look out for, like cracking, the snow like cracking under your feet um, can like indicate instability. Um, as well as hearing that like hollow sound, that like woomphing sound. Um, I think above all, really just like kind of educating yourself about those warning signs that it's, you know, like you, the hiker, know what to be looking out for. Like, like we're just talking about where is it likely to happen under what conditions um, and what am I looking out for? So, and you can always look at like um, avalanche forecasts. There's a lot of um, incredible resources out there. Uh, something from the chat. Um, let me mention this one because um, I think some people probably wonder this. So I, earlier you're speaking about like if we have um, equipment to carry, if you have like an aggressive itinerary, um, Amy asked, if we have an aggressive itinerary, we want an ice axe all summer. What is aggressive? Pace, mileage, off trail, steep passes. I plan about 18 miles per day, JMT starting on 816th. Is that aggressive? Um, yeah, sure. That's good. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I think that's good. Um, the JMT I generally wouldn't consider to be aggressive, um, just because it's it's going to be very well packed out. Um, there's going to be a very like a very good trail on uh, on the JMT. Let me show you the difference of like sort of aggressive, not aggressive. So I need to kind of orient myself here. Okay, so that's View Lakes. Um, so let me get back to Sequoia Kings, which is an area I know really well, and. Okay, so this is, oops, to orient you, this is the South Fork here. This is Mather Pass. Here's Palisade Lakes. And this is the old Cartridge Pass. This is the old John Muir Trail that goes into Lake Basin. And you'll notice just on the contour lines here, so this is, this is in meters. So this is steeper than it, than it would look if it were, or, or it doesn't, it's, it doesn't look as steep because it's 20 meter contour intervals as opposed to your normal 40 feet. Um, but this is not that steep through here. But then if you look over at, like this is the Sierra High Route that goes over, I can't remember, the, I think this is, is this Frozen Lake Pass? I think that's the name of it. This is, that's very steep on this side. So like that I would consider to be an aggressive pass. Um, or another example would be on the Sierra High Route, um, so the one thing that's going to hang up everybody this summer is going to be let's push up. Let's see, I'm looking for here's Muir Pass. Okay, here we go. So this is the bridge that's down. It's over in this area here. So. Um, a lot of people are planning alternates around here and some of the some of the off-trail alternates like this is alpine call and alpine call we're back to 40 feet, foot contours now and that just doesn't look that steep to me when i look at that like it's steepish but not super aggressive um in comparison if we go a little further over to the west i can find snow tongue pass here's snow tongue pass and snow tongue pass is a that is something else that's super steep um with with Caltopo, you've got some neat features um you can measure uh, like the slope angle here is 50 degrees. That's a good a good little tool for you to use. You could also turn on the slope angle shading, which is a great feature. So like where you see that purple, you're like, ooh, man, that purple's really, really unfriendly. This red would be a little bit better, but still you'd end up in some purple through this. And if we were to go back over looking at Alpine Call, notice how, notice how much easier Alpine Call looks when it's color shaded. Okay. Great. Um, I think it would be good to speak to some of like the route decisions that people will be making in the field. So there's a couple questions like, um, can you talk to snow bridge safety or the likelihood of how late in the season they might be around? I don't think snow bridge, I, um, I bet most of the snow bridges are, are going to be gone by the middle of June. Just okay. they're, they're going to get ripped out by all the milk. So I wouldn't plan on them being there. So you might be reading trout uh, like 
uh, uh, trail reports from PCT hikers that are out there right now. I read one yesterday that talked about how he was able to find snow bridges on most of the crossings, and that's not going to be the case um, very soon. So it's going to be. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't count on snow bridges. And then is, if you do encounter one, I mean, so the best thing to do is you take your trekking pole and you jab at it, mm -hmm. and you get a sense for for how thick it is and how and how sturdy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it if you, you think it's suspect. But be, be listening for them, like a lot of times. I mean, a lot of times it's obvious, you know, where there's water rushing underneath, but a lot of times um, just be paying attention. Yeah, and I, and be extra cautious with where, um, where if the snow bridge collapses, it could be very, very um, mm -hmm. dangerous. So like if there's a waterfall right downstream of the snow bridge, maybe, maybe you get your feet wet instead. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, sun cups, lovely to look at, but a pain in the ass to navigate. Any suggestions on how to best navigate through snow fields, considering the different conditions at different times of day? Um, I think we spoke to that a little bit, but is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, I mean, snow cups are tough. They're awkward. They're just, they're never the same size. And um, I do think that's one of the places where having some traction is helpful just because it, it will cut down on all that slipping and sliding, which can be tough on a lot of that like connective tissue or connective like the ligaments and stuff, the supporting muscles, all your like all your cutting sports muscles, which a lot of backpackers don't have. Yes. Uh, let's see. I'm seeing a couple of these too. So yeah, um, I'm seeing a lot of this term. This, what does aggressive mean? <laughs> That's yes. kind of the summary. Um, but let me. <laughs> There can be aggressive sections of of easy trails. So, um, as an example, like the High Sierra Trail, it, you know, it's um, it could be very aggressive if you're doing it right now because there are some super steep sections on the High Sierra Trail that in July are completely completely melted out, but right now they're going to be filled in with snow. So, like where they where they've blasted the trail into. In fact, you know what? Maybe we should. Um, do we want to go take a look at? Uh, do we want to go take a look at the High Sierra Trail right now? Let's do that. A lot of people want to know about the High Sierra Trail. Okay. Um, this uh, speaking of uh, terms like aggressive, um, a lot of someone said a lot of the. I see the phrase expert level used a lot for detours. What does this mm -hmm. mean? Is it be in shape and know how to navigate off trail and use snow gear or something more in depth? I think that's about right. I mean, I think that's correct too. Yeah, yeah. I think expert level. When I think about like, if I describe something as expert level, um, you know, someone who's like a very competent navigator, someone who's comfortable in very challenging conditions like steep, steep terrain, um, someone who knows how to use ice axes and crampons. So this is the High Sierra Trail. Here's Kauai Gap, and just for you know, this is what I was saying. So like. You know, the High Sierra Trail in the summertime, this thing is all melted out. It's just like, you know, you could almost drive a car on some of these sections. But man, like if this thing, this is, there's a tunnel through here. If that is filled in with snow, that would be terrifying. So like right now, now the, the, the thing that's going to save some people is that the High Sierra Trail, this is all self-facing. So let's take a look at, okay, so this is still pretty snowy looking. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not ready yet, but it's only May 31st. So, um, maybe where is that trail? So like, you can actually already see this upper trail. This is actually already melted out. So that's, that's encouraging that snowshoot though, that thing, even like, God, I mean, even if that is like 10 feet of like 10 feet of a, of an avalanche shoot, that could be really mm -hmm. scary. Okay. Yes. We had uh, multiple people in the chat and in um, email asked about the two bridges that are out and um, mm. potential reroute options. And if you have an estimate for when you think, <laughs> yeah. if you could use your crystal. Ball. <laughs> well, yeah, the park service gives me all sorts of info. Okay. So the folks who, um, uh, let me, so this page right here this is the this is like a definitive post if you're going to go on the high sierra this summer you need this resource this is the um, hazardous high sierra creeks list map and alternates and if you find this page you'll there are two updates at the top 
And there's this post, which will give you detours for the, the South Fork of the San Joaquin. And then uh, this post just discusses these two other bridges. Um, but the key thing is that this map, that it's a public map. It's, it's in Caltopo. Oh, man. And this map has all of the like sort of problematic or known uh, water crossings. Um, so as an example, like it's got already an update here. This is the this is the bridge over the south the South Fork of the San Joaquin, and these blue options these are some of the potential alternates. So like you could take this one, which gets you most of the John Muir Trail, except for this one, but it's really far out of the way. The one that probably most people are going to take, it's this one that goes over, it goes over Bishop Pass right here, and then it goes over Paiute Pass. There's some permitting issues um, here because this they only allow like 35 new hikers every day out of, I think this is, um, uh, this would for Paiute Pass. Um, so I think probably a lot of hikers are going to be breaking that permit thing. Um, the other neat thing is you could, easily resupplied down in Bishop from here. So I think a lot of hikers are going to take that one. Um, anyone who's really bold, like this would be the expert level option. So this, if I were on the John Muir Trail, like I would consider myself to be expert level, I would just take this little detour right here. Simple, um, pretty clean, looks good on satellite. But um, this side hill here, this could be difficult for people who aren't accustomed to off to travel. And there are a few places down here where you can get yourself in trouble. Um, as far as the Woods Creek, so I know that's another one that's been talked about recently. Um, this is a this is a real problem. <laughs> this this one is actually this is very inconvenient. So here's the Wood Creek Bridge right here, and this thing's been damaged and it's tilting. And the Park Service, I'm not sure if they're just going to chop the thing down or if they're going to tell or if they're just going to tell people not to use it but let people use it. But there's there are really no good options here. Uh, the one option is to just to stay on this side of the creek, but this is like brushy and tallassy. So, and I, I think it might be, there really are no good places. Like the creek never really slows down. So if you look at the contour lines, you're like contour line, contour line, contour line, contour line, contour line. It's like maybe right here, this would actually be a good place to cross if you had to cross, but that still is gonna leave you probably like two miles to get down, just down to the confluence. And then this section going back upstream, this looks terrible too. So um, I don't, there really are not very many good options here for Woods Creek if that bridge is out. That's a real, that's, that's, that's not great. Because you can't, you're not going to go over this. And then you're also not going to go over this either. That also doesn't buy you anything because you still have to cross woods. Sorry, folks. The other bridge that's out, since I since I just am like total downer, but I'll give you some good news. The, the other bridge that's out, it's up near Red's Meadow. So the bridge is, uh, where is it? It's right here. So the bridge is, that's out is right here. And the, easily, you can just follow this red line. So the John Muir Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail, they come right through here. Let me turn on the Forest Service map. So here's the Pacific Crest Trail and John Muir Trail. And you just, you just get the road. Here's, here's Red's Meadow. And you just walk the road and you bypass the bridge that's out and then you just rejoin the John Muir Trail right here and Pacific Crest Trail right here. So that's that's a that's a easy one. Yay. Is there a few more? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. it's it's eight o'clock. Let's um I I'm willing to run a little long, but this is gonna be an endless number of questions probably that keep coming. So Katie, what's what's our solution for answering questions? Do we have one? Um, it's a lot of time. You're leaving on. You're leaving tomorrow morning. I am leaving. Um, folks, if you have questions, you can send them to me. Um, it's Andrew at andrewskirka.com. I will do my best to answer them. But at some point, actually, you know what, Katie? Let's let's do this. Let's continue to send them to hi Sierra at at andrewskirka.com. Katie, maybe we set up a forward so I, I get them too. And um, I'll do my best to get them. But yeah, many of them. So I would say use a lot of the information that's shared in the blog post as well as what we shared here um, to make 
route choices um, from, because a lot of them are, uh, we've spoken to a lot of what was in the questions that have already been asked about, because many of them are very specific. I'd like to, you know, I have an August 3rd permit for Yosemite High Route going south. Do I need micro spikes? That type of thing. Um, so I would say try to use a lot of the information that's been provided here. And then, yeah. Yeah. Folks are going to have to extrapolate what we've shown to their own situation. So remember mm -hmm. how we, we showed you, here are, the t here are the main tutorials. So we showed you the Sentinel satellite imagery for, for snow. We showed you the river gauges for water levels. Um, we're just going to tell you that like you should just be prepared for bugs, which is a pretty easy thing to do. You should be prepared for lots of sun exposure, pretty easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. What else was on that list, Katie? Those were the big ones. OK. Yeah. Um, let's do two more. Um, sure. There's been a few questions about cornices, both um, in the chat and then um, in the emails, just like where you expect them, are they a concern, and then how to approach them safely. Like someone who's doing the Kings Canyon High Basin route asks, like, do you think King Cole will have a cornice all summer? Yes, King Cole is going to have a huge cornice. <laughs> it's going to be massive. Uh, yeah, it might be like plugged the whole summer. I don't know. I'm nervous. I'd be curious. I kind of want to go up there and see it myself, but it's so far out of the way. Uh, so, you know, the, the way to, I think the best approach for cornices, so if you can do a little bit of research and you, and you can read about a cornice. Mm -hmm. So let me give you two examples. And, um, I love there, there are a bunch of people watching and we're flying all over. Oh, that's not going to get me there. Um, uh, Nope. Um, what else is another? Let's see, let's here we go. So here is King Call. It's this. Um, oops. Is it? It's this one. It's this one right here, I think. I have to look at my maps. No, no, I take that back. It's right here. So this is King Call, and look at all the purple. And what ha the snow just fills in there, and it develops this um, like this big cornice. And and if you look at the satellite on it, oh, you can actually see the cornice on it. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's just it's kind of wall to wall. There's like this slab on this side, and it's kind of broken bedrock on this side. And it's um, there's really no way into the into the the chute itself without going over the top of this of this cornice. Um, in comparison, just to the south, uh, Longley Pass, this also develops a cornice. Um, but you can see you've got a little bit more, you can work your way left and get and get around it. So some satellite imagery would, some, would help, maybe some like some guidebook descriptions would help. And then I think the key thing, if you're just going to be attempting any of this, is you need to give yourself enough margin that you can turn around. Like you do not want to put like must go features at the end of your trip because you're going to be pressured to to come to take them on, mm -hmm. and um, that could lead to bad results. Um, you, what you want to do is you want to front load all those major challenges to kind of get them out of the way, and that way you know how much time you're you're working with to get yourself out without uh, having to ration your food yeah. or making your your partner nervous and your cats. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's... Okay, last question. This was one of the top Reddit posts when I last looked. Um, Andrew, how much extra beans do you recommend bringing to account for the slower travel and increased calorie needs? <laughs> no. I know that. I know that's sarcastic. I'll try to give a little answer to it though. Um, <laughs> it, it, um, I am planning on all my trips ending on time, but if you if you're attempting a route that we're just it looks like there are a lot of uncertainties you might want to pack a little bit of extra food it would just buy you a little bit of extra time okay. and comfort so that way if something unexpected happens you don't feel compelled to like keep pushing and as an example just you imagine over a six or seven day itinerary that you're a half day behind and you reach a water crossing at the very end of the day when you would really had hoped to reach it at the beginning of the day 
So like, so what are you going to do? Like, you know, you're kind of like, oh, I'm almost out of food. I got to get out of here. So whereas if you like, and you'd be tempted to cross it. Whereas if you're like, hey, I'm sitting on a half day of food still, I'm just going to hang out here and, um, you know, hang out and wait for this water crossing to come down and then I'll hike out in the morning. It's like, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just thinking about like more broadly speaking, that conditions are just, I mean, obviously going to be more challenging and preparing for that, both in like your mindset and in like what the gear that you bring um, and in the amount of food that you bring, like you're going to be walking through more um, like snow is harder to walk in post hole and you burn more energy. Um, so thinking about that, not, not being forced into certain route decisions because you're short on food or if you're on the fence of, do I have the fitness to attempt this route this year or not? Maybe this isn't the year to do it because the conditions are already going to be more challenging. So just like keeping that in mind in general with like all the decisions that you're making this year, um, I think is wise. Yep. I'm just like JG 91's comment. King call is sketchy without <laughs> <saw> snow. That. <laughs> He's right. He's right. It's sketchy. Yeah. All sketchy. right. Any okay. other closing words? No, I think that's probably good. Um, maybe just to, so just to summarize folks, like expect challenging conditions out there this summer. Um, be conservative, have a well, have a, like a, a, a well thought out plan um, mm -hmm. and um, be prepared to be flexible when you're out there. Just realize that these are not normal conditions. Um, you know, go out there, test the waters and try to make something happen, but just go out there kind of open-minded and flexible and um, be prepared to do something that you weren't necessarily expecting cause just because nature has um, decided um, it's going to win in 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think use the resources avail available to you. It's like when you know how to um, at least make a prediction with some of the expected conditions and do some of the things that we've looked through today, um, you're less susceptible to making poor choices or to like all the fear mongering that might be going around um, because you know how to, to find information and make some educated guesses. Yep. Awesome. All right. Thanks for hosting, Katie. Thanks for everyone for showing up. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Good, good luck night. this summer. Yeah. Good, good night. Stay safe.